right, good to see y'all here this evening at Anchor Baptist Church. We're going to get started with 408 in your hymnals. 408, Loyalty to Christ. Now, I'm not super familiar with this one, so we're going to have to take it with a, take a little sub. Well, you know, that, go that speed. It'll be fine. 408, Loyalty to Christ. Go that speed. I'll catch up. I'll figure it out. From over hill and plain, there comes a single strain. Tis loyalty, loyalty, loyalty to Christ. Its music rolls along, the hills take up the song. Of loyalty, loyalty, yes, loyalty to Christ. On to victory. Our Christ, our great commander. On, we'll move at his command. We'll soon possess the land through loyalty, loyalty, loyalty to Christ. This is a good warm up exercise. Verse 2 Oh, hear the brave sound that moves the earth around. Tis loyalty, loyalty, loyalty to Christ. Oh, rise to dare and do. Bring out the watchword true of loyalty, loyalty, loyalty to Christ. On to victory, on to victory, cries our great commander on. We'll move at his command, we'll soon possess the land through loyalty, loyalty, loyalty to Christ. Come join our loyal throng, we'll root the giants wrong. Tis loyalty, loyalty, loyalty to Christ. Where Satan's banners float, we'll send the bugle note. Of loyalty, loyalty, loyalty to Christ. On to victory, on to victory, cries our great commander on. We'll move at his command. We'll soon possess the land through loyalty, loyalty, loyalty to Christ. The strength of youth we lay at Jesus' feet today. Tis loyalty, loyalty, loyalty to Christ. His gospel we'll proclaim throughout the world's domain. Of loyalty, loyalty, loyalty to Christ. All on to victory, on to victory, cries our great commander. On. We'll move at his command, we'll soon possess the land. Through loyalty, loyalty, loyalty to Christ. Amen, Brother Hanson. Tell you all about his years of music really paid off. But it is not easy to throw your hand around, read music, and then read the words. Yeah. We got it on the fourth one though. I did so you have all that. Yeah, because I was having a hard time following that. Not that I'm an English major, I mean a music major. Chuck, why don't you open us up in prayer, please? Thank you. Um, Sherry put out, Shirley put out an uh, email talking about upcoming Sunday school. They still need some volunteers, and she's got a schedule, but uh, I was hoping she'd be here. Wouldn't, uh, she, you need to contact her if you're interested in that ministry. Um, get them young and train them, but uh, we, we're stepping away from that a little bit, and I think it's important that we have these young kids in there, and they, they I've watched them for 20 years. They, they learn a lot of Bible, and they get up here and put on their little skits, and they quote Bi more Bible verses than most adults can sometimes, or most of the time. So keep that in mind. 
Tomorrow, Gloria's going to have cataract surgery. Gloria. I think it's at 1 o'clock in the Plata. Uh, just keep her in uh, prayer. And Karen Thompson still has high blood pressure. Does anybody talk with them? Okay. And um, Ronnie Redding, is she still having heart attacks? Okay. All right. And keep uh, Howard Hunter in prayer. He's getting ready to wind up his work over there. I think he comes up in September. Yeah, and uh, he's been there for three months or whatever, and uh, I hear a good five months. But well, it sounds like yesterday to me. Um, but it, he's had some uh, good results and stuff like that, so keep him in prayer. Um <clears throat> How about anybody get a chance to witness to anybody today or this week? All right, I was in the cardiologist yesterday. I got a, I, I uh, got talking to a guy who's got cancer coming up to coming up the elevator, and just when I'm getting ready to witness to him, the uh, elevator doors open, and in, in watched the, walked a herd of people, and he got swept back in the office, and I didn't see him anymore. But I, I, his name is Hill, I think. I, I text you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've got it on my phone also. I'll give it to you in a little bit. I don't have it avail available. Anyway, um, anybody for salvation? You'd like to get saved again? I, I, you talk about that. I, I can take you to within 10 square feet of where I got saved, and I know I got saved because I've never felt like that in my entire life. I've never felt like that again, but that, that moment, I knew things had changed, and uh, I, I mean, I stepped out of darkness into light. It was the best day of my life, so. and if you want to read about it, it's in this month's um, uh, Baptist Bread, so uh, my testimony's in there. Yeah, I'm, I'm officially published. Nobody's ever going to read it unless they're sitting on the toilet or something, but I'm officially published. <laughs> so, anyway, um, sickness. Boss, what's going on? You get, did you get your ear ENT? Dr. Dash, you are a patient. Just remember that. And you're in his group, I think. Used it to stop darts. <laughs> yeah, I got the, Well, at least you got them off. Uh, my brother-in-law, Kenzie, was supposed to leave tomorrow to go to the mountains. We were going to all meet up there. And he got a call from the pathologist and the margins on his head. Now, I think you saw the picture. Are, they're not clean. So they, there's three options. Go back and do more surgery, basically take the whole top of his head off. Uh, do this chemo cream or radiation. Radiation is 90 plus percent effective. He's 77, 78 years old. So uh, he's going to have radiation done. They've canceled their... Uh, their trip to the mountains, so we won't be going down there. Anyway, uh, I'd appreciate it if you'd keep him in prayer. I mean, those guys can't go through a door without something falling on them. Yes, sir. Do I? I don't have their, I'm trying to get their contact information. Does anybody know how to get a hold of Lou and Melissa? No, you didn't give it to me, huh? All right. Oh. Uh, Um, <clears throat> we'll keep them in the little Melissa Andres. Um, 
uh, ladies with child. Anybody have anything they want to put on the prayer list tonight? Yes, sir. Mikey. His face dropped. Yeah. yeah. It usually goes goes away after a while. Yeah. Um, Good. Where is home for her? Raleigh? Okay. Furniture factory. Um, okay, work situation, Jason? Uh, Chris and I are going to be on the road this weekend. Uh, we'll be back Wednesday, I believe. Um, yes, ma'am. Oh, I, for all the we didn't know that Diane was a cheerleader. I saw her a little in her little tutu this morning, an old picture after we blew the dust off. That's a fact. I saw it. <laughs> a couple. Okay. And then under others, I know I mentioned it, but if you pick make all the people that still go around to Okay. Um, what was the name of that preacher last night? Yeah, this guy Knowles. Um, <clears throat> made a statement, and it just, it just rang so true. The spirit of this country has changed in the last couple of years. I don't know that we're ever going to change it or change direction with it. Pardon me? Right, right. The whole spirit of the country has changed. And you, you see these... <clears throat> I grew up in a different era, man. I mean, your neighbor could whip your butt if you screwed up, you know? And um, they, 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 we're not doing anything, you know? It says, uh, spare the rod, love not the child. You know, last I heard, you know, you feed them and take care of them. But man, I'm getting off on a tangent. I don't mean to do that. This, right. The spirit of this world, this country, has changed, and you just be aware of that. Because Tim Green said something to me one time about uh, demonic possession, and, and he gave me a bunch of literature on it. You gotta be careful. You might go in there and think you're gonna do something, and that bad boy wind up in you. So, and I, there's a lot of crazy people out there. So, anyway, yes. Pardon me?
What's that pastor's name? Ed Spicer. I've heard that name. Why would I? I met him through a different friend. He didn't go to PBI. His dad was a pastor for a while. Okay. Well, it's, you know, if you get an opportunity to do it, and we have our we we just let our lives get so caught up, and what used to take us ten minutes now takes us an hour, and we fall in that we let that become an excuse sometimes. So, uh, the he who fa fails to plan fails to plan. So, and uh, anyway, anybody have anything else? But yes, please. Thank you. You know, the thing you need to recognize about Glory is Glory is functional. Right. And she can, is able to take care of herself, but she cannot maintain the pace that, and you've seen it, that she had when she's in the shop. When she's cutting hair, she's got five or six customers in front of her and just kicks them out of there, you know, but she can't do that anymore. So she's functional. Pray tomorrow that this cataract surgery is, is effective and will do what we have, what they want it to do. And, just pray for her. Around 1 o'clock, she's going to have that surgery. Lift her up. Anybody have anything else? Say that again. Okay. Where do you show your, where do you go for your horse shows? All around or are you? In, in, in Prince George's County? Yeah. Okay. The old Marlboro racetrack? Been there once or twice, have you? <laughs> All right. You mean a deep brain stimulator? Did he have a Parkinson? He does have a Parkinson. Yeah, it's called deep brain stimulation, and they'll dial him in with a cell phone. He, you know, they do this, you can watch them, and they'll be just, it's weird. It's like. That was good. And then, um, Ed and Melissa, um, he had a, a mole removed on the eyebrow, and they had to do it on None of it's good, but basil is probably the least invasive. Yeah. The squima and the. Uh, right. Okay.
Okay. Did you get that, Sherry? Okay. All right. Anybody have anything else? Um, well, I want you to pray for the prayer list, pastor's message. Four hundred fifty-two in your hymnals. Four hundred fifty-two. My Savior's love. Let's stand and we'll sing. Four hundred fifty-two. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. I tell you, the more, the more you get into that Bible, the more amazing it is. It'll really work on you. Four hundred fifty-two. My Savior's love. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous, oh, For me, for me it was in the garden, he prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall end. The angels beheld him and came from the world of light to comfort him in the sorrows he bore for my soul that night. Oh, how marvelous! Oh, took my sins and my sorrows, he made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous, And with the ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see. Twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall end. can be seated. Jonathan, can I get some help? I got to set up the whiteboard here. Oh boy.
Yes, there are good markers in the back. Uh, I didn't get any more than what's already back there, but. Oh, I see now I'm all turned around. We'll get combobulated here in a minute. They have a, uh, allegedly, they have a sign over the customer service uh, station at the Chicago airport called the recombobulation zone. So if you get discombobulated from traveling, you can get recombobulated back there. I don't know what being bobulated means, but, or, Apparently it's a good thing, so, but uh, we're going to pick up where I was teaching on Sunday morning, and that is the book of Habakkuk, and I'm going to pray and then get started, as I can remember my water bottle, notes, I have my Bible, that's an improvement, let's pray and then we'll get started. Lord, we thank you for getting us here this evening, God. We thank you for a, a word, Lord. Thank you for loving us, God. That just a, a marvelous love that that is, God. I pray you'd help us to spend more time as Christians, Lord, living in that and trying to, to, to meditate on that and to love you more, Lord, for the love that you've shown us. I pray you'd bless tonight, Lord, in the teaching. I pray you'd help me to, to get the references and uh, be able to teach your word as it is in truth, Lord, and I just pray that it be a blessing to your people, help them to understand you better and your word better. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so um, I'd, Brother Klotz had talked to me about teaching in the Institute, and I'm still not sure if that's going to happen, uh, but if I do, uh, the Lord had kind of pointed me in the direction of the Minor Prophets, um, because they've taught the first half of the Minor Prophets, and a lot of your preachers break up the Minor Prophets into two parts, just because there's a lot of minor prophets, and it's not easy to cover the entire thing in a single work. Uh, so I got a bunch of books on it, and I got some commentaries on it, and uh, I got a lot of good info out of it, and I'm going to re review a little bit of this here. Um, so the book of Habakkuk ha takes place somewhere between the captivity of Israel by Assyria in 722 and the first captivity of Babylon uh, of Judah uh, in 606. Now, when you read through your Bible, you got the kingdom that David is in charge of, and when Solomon takes over, he sins, and because he sins against God, God tells him that his son is going to lose half of it. And when Solomon dies and Rehoboam takes over, Jeroboam takes the ten northern tribes, and that's generally referred to as Israel in your Bible. And uh, Rehoboam takes Benjamin, Judah, and parts of Levi, or Benjamin, Judah, and all the Levi that's gathered out of here. It gets to be a little messy. Uh, and then throughout time, they did get different gleanings of different Israelites who want to serve God. Uh, but for the most part, it's generally referred to just as Judah. And that goes on for a long time. And the first thing that Israel does is they immediately make two golden calves, and they put one in the south and one in the north, because the king does not want people going to Jerusalem, like the law says they're supposed to do, twice a year. Because if your king has, to, or if your people have to go to a foreign capital twice a year, they're not going to stay loyal to you. So he says, oh man, I got new markers. Ooh, I hope these are dark. It's all right. We will, you work with what you got. You don't work with what you don't. But uh, they, they're up here. And they got their two uh, idols, and they got one in Dan and one in Beersheba. And those are a snare to Israel for the entirety of their existence. And God puts up with them and puts up with them and puts up with them. And eventually in 722, because they've sinned, he sends Assyria in. And they invade them, and they take them out of their land, and they put them in captivity. And then they put their own people back in the land. And Assyria is up here. And that means that Israel, northern Israel, gets mixed racially uh, from then on out. And they become known in your New Testament as the Samaritans. And that's why the Jews don't like them. It's because they're mixed race. They're not pure-blooded Jew. And they say, well, you're not really Jews. You're not real Jews. You're just half-breeds. You're half-bloods. You don't have any of the promises. You're 
all kinds of nasty things. They don't like them. Uh, and now, the South fares a little bit better, and most of your book of First and Second Kings is about them and how well they do with their struggles with idolatry and different things. And in, God starts to warn them and say, hey, you guys need to keep your heart right. And the book of Hosea is really good about that because in the book of Hosea, he starts talking about, Israel, you got to get your heart right. Judah, you're doing pretty good. By the time Hosea gets to the end of his life, he goes, Judah, y'all ain't doing so hot no more. And Judah starts to fall into that idolatry. And eventually, God sends Babylon, which is way over here, and Babylon comes in, and Babylon invades Judah. Uh, it's called a couple different things. It's called Babylon. It's called Chaldea. And it's the Chaldean people. And that's because the city of Babylon uh, is a very, very old city. Uh, it's one of your first cities that gets built after the Tower of Babel. And it goes through several different empires. And the city of Babylon eventually gets destroyed, and it got rebuilt uh, in the late 90s by Saddam Hussein. Uh, but it starts out going through a, several different iterations, and it goes through the Chaldeans, and eventually the Chaldeans, uh, they lose their empire to the Medes and the Persians, and the Media Persia takes over. And then after that, the Persians kick the Medes out, they take dominance, and after that it goes through a couple more hands before it eventually gets leveled and becomes desolate. But the book of Habakkuk is Israel's been taken away, Judah's messing up, and Judah needs to get right before God has to send the hammer in. And Habakkuk is unlike most of your other uh, prophets. And, oh, uh, one thing real quick. The reason I've got two dates here, this is about a 120-year span. It's like, well, how come you don't know any closer than that? Because the book of Habakkuk never mentions a king. It never mentions a tangible event. The only thing it says is, this is coming. So we know it hasn't happened yet. But how close is it? It's kind of anybody's guess. It's probably closer to this than further away, the way he's talking about Judah. Now, uh, that's the historic. And you know, all your, spirit, all your passages get applied three ways, historically, spiritually, and doctrinally. So historically, we don't know when he wrote it. It's somewhere between these two dates, and it's written, directed at Judah. Spiritually, Habakkuk is pretty unique in that Habakkuk talks mostly about the prophet Habakkuk's struggle with God on this. And as you read through it, you understand. The verse 1 starts with Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 1, the burden which Habakkuk uh, the prophet did see. And it goes immediately into verse 2, O Lord, how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? This is him talking to God. This isn't him preaching at the people. This isn't doing what Ezekiel did, which is laying the door of the tabernacle and preach at the people. It's not Jeremiah going to the princes and preaching to them. It's Habakkuk and his personal walk with God and Habakkuk sees this coming. He's a prophet. God shows it to him. And it doesn't matter how much you don't like somebody, you don't want the Chaldeans showing up on their front doorstep. The Chaldeans are cruel and wicked, and he talks a lot about them, and he is concerned because Israel can stop it if they want to. They can stop the Chaldeans from coming, but it would take them getting right with God. And they're not doing it. And that's why as this man is preaching, he's preaching with the urgency of understanding that these people are coming and you can't stop them on your own. You need God to stop them. And if you don't get your heart right, you're all going to die. And that's what a good preacher preaches. He preaches from understanding you need to get your heart right because if you don't, you're on your way to hell. Now what he's got is he's got an invading nation coming and he says, you all don't know what's going to happen. I've seen this. Now, we haven't seen hell. You haven't had a vision of hell. This man had visions. This man had God showing him stuff, and he is burdened, which is a good preacher. He's concerned about the people around him, even though they're wicked. Uh, but what he's preaching to them is, one, God's got to punish sin. He can't just let it go. God delights in mercy. He delights in long-suffering. But you can't... Long-suffering is not... Letting someone get away with something. Long-suffering, we talked about this when we taught it. Long-suffering is forestalling judgment for long enough for someone else to understand what the Scripture says, have God work on them, and God change their hearts to show them that they're wrong and give them space for repentance. And then if they repent, the judgment that comes is much more merciful than if they hadn't repented. 
So God has to judge the sin, but if they had repented, it would have been much better. And that's what King Zedekiah, who's the last king of Judah, uh, Israel, or sorry, Judah gets invaded three times, 606, 600, I believe, and 586. It happens three times. And Zedekiah is the king for the third one when it really, really gets completely flattened. And Jeremiah comes to him, or he, uh, uh, Zedekiah comes to Jeremiah and he says, What's the message from God? And he says, If you'll surrender, they'll spare your life, they'll spare your family. And Zedekiah goes, Yea, but I fear the princes. And he doesn't do it. And God has to judge him incredibly harshly because he doesn't get it right. And you figure, there's 400 years of wickedness and idolatry going wrong. And God's willing still to be merciful to them if they would just turn and just listen to him. Because what happens to Zedekiah is he tries to escape. The Chaldeans catch him. They kill his family. They put his eyes out. They take him and change to Babylon. And God tells him, if you had just surrendered... All the way up to the last minute, God is still willing to show mercy. God's still trying to show mercy. He's still sending his prophets to give them mercy all the way up to the last possible second, and they don't take it. So this is Habakkuk struggling because he knows Israel is wicked, and he knows God is long-suffering with his people, um, but the Chaldeans are way more wicked than the Jews are. There are still some good Jews. When Elijah's preaching, he says there's still... I think it's, what, 3,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal? It's three or eight, I forget, that have not bowed the knee to Baal. There's still some good people in Judah, and you hear them talked about, it talks about the innocent and how much the innocent are being abused. And he knows that if the Chaldeans come in, that these innocent people are going to suffer. There are going to be people who are going to go through things. It says they're not going to regard the young man or the old, the infant, they're not going to regard the woman with child. They're not going to have any regard for anybody. They're going to do whatever they want to anybody they feel like. They're going to take everything they want and be off and leave them to do whatever with whoever's left. Uh, and that bothers him because good people are still going to suffer because of this. But he's trying to understand how God works. God, how come you're letting this wicked, wicked nation invade this much less wicked nation? And the answer is because this less wicked nation has God. And God expects more out of his people than he expects out of the heathen. And that's what you've got to understand, Christian. To whom much is given, much is required. And God is harder on Judah than he is on the other countries because Judah knew better. Judah had prophets. They had priests. They have inspired scripture. And they run from God. So that's the spiritual application that you can take as a Christian, is Habakkuk is him understanding that even though things go wrong in life, God is still in control, and we don't understand how the Almighty thinks. He's God. He's Almighty. He's in charge. He knows everything. He's looking thousands of years into the future at his people, and he knows that this is going to help him. As awful as getting invaded and overrun and the, the horrors and atrocities and the genocide that takes place, he knows that it's better for him in the long run because he's God. But anybody on this earth, any human, would look at that and go, that's not God. And that's why there's all these people, they go over and they go to war and they come back and they say, there can't be a God, there can't be a God, God did this. And you're not going to figure God out in 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. You get all these dumb college kids and they're 20 years old and they're trying to tell God how he should be doing his job. I mean, that's what a lot of them do. They're like, oh, that can't, I know that can't be a God because this happened to my best friend Cindy, and she's a really sweet girl. I don't know why if there was a God, that God would let Cindy get killed by a drunk driver. So you've figured out that God's wrong. You've judged God, and you've figured out that he's wrong, and you're 20 years on this earth because you knew Cindy so well, you knew that she didn't deserve it in the eyes of a perfect, righteous, almighty, holy God. Okay, I'm sorry. But you don't understand how God works. And that's why Habakkuk is still very relevant for you today, because it's a, it shows how a prophet helps to understand. It shows how a prophet submits himself to the will of God, even though he doesn't understand it. And then doctrinally. And I said this on Sunday, and I'll say it again because I'm still mad about it. I read nine commentaries on this. They've all got different things, and some of them are go to the Hebrew, and some of them go to the this. Some of them are intentionally to spiritual. But nobody talks about doctrine except for Dr. Ruckman. 
And you, when you've gone through it, you try to not be a Ruckman guy all the way. Like, oh, I'm not going to do this. I'm, well, I'm going to find somebody else. And nobody else does. What do you? You can go to a Hoffman Bible, which is built from a, a, a Ruckman reference Bible. You could even maybe, I don't, know, I don't know if anybody's got a Schofield, but when it comes to commentaries, none <laughs> of the other commentaries talk about the doctrine. By the way, everything that this is talking about has future application. Because the king of Babylon, the king of Assyria, are some of your strongest types of the Antichrist in the Bible. And when it talks about the persecution of Jewish people, the invasion of the land of Israel, it's all foreshadowing, it's all giving very exact details about what's going to happen in this country, probably, Lord willing, hopefully in the next 10 years. It's all future, it's all prophetic, it's all second advent. It's discussing the Antichrist coming in and setting up his kingdom in Jewish land and taking over Jewish people. So we're going to really dig into the doctrinal here a little bit, because uh, Sunday I already covered these a little bit more in depth. Uh, but we're going to read through, um, and then we'll, we'll start in verse 1. The Bible says, The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Uh, that's Proverbs chapter 1. Help keep your hand in Habakkuk, because Habakkuk is hard to find. And go to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1, look down in verse 24. And the whole first part of Proverbs is about a man taking counsel and getting uh, yoked up with some wicked men. In verse 24, Because I have called, and ye refused, I have stretched out mine hand, and no man regarded. But ye have said it not all my counsel, and would none of my reproof, I will even laugh when you're at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, mark that word whirlwind. Every time you see the word whirlwind, it's generally a reference to the second advent. When distress and anguish cometh upon you, then they shall call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And they have no wisdom, they have no knowledge, they have chosen to neglect God, and because they've chosen to neglect God, God has chosen to neglect them when the hour when they need it. Verse 30, For they would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof, therefore they shall eat the fruit of their own ways and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely, and shall be quiet from fear of evil. So, in this passage, he's talking about these people... It's a double application. You've got, he's crying out because of, uh, because of violence and spoil. There's injustice going on in Judah. He's very upset about that injustice. He's very concerned because the people that are innocent are being taken advantage of by the people who are not. And the people who are willing to cheat the system are making more than the people who are not willing to cheat the system. And they're driving them out and they're taking over and you can't make an honest living anymore. And that's the first application is, God, the people who are here that are doing right, they're suffering because God always is long-suffering. And then when these Babylonians and Chaldeans come in, all these wicked people are going to cry out to you because they're Jews, that's what they're going to do, and you're not going to listen to them. They're going to cry and there's going to be people coming in and coming in over the wall and burning the houses down and burning the city down and burning the palaces down. And they're going, oh God, oh God, oh God. And God's going to, I'm not listening. Yeah, you, I gave you 400 years to repent, and you ignored me. And now it's time. It's like when you tell your kid, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And then they do it. And then you grab them by the hand, you take them back to the bedroom or back to the bathroom, where they got this, and they're going, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's too late at that point. You already did it. The whipping is inevitable. That's what it is. He says, well, they're going to get to that point, and then they're going to go, oh, there's no God because God let this happen. No. God didn't let it happen for 400 years, all right? But people don't look about, the, they don't think about that. Verse 3, why dost thou shew me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. 
Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. So this first part here, he's talking about the people who are doing right are getting taken advantage of by the people who are doing wrong. And the corrupt people and the corrupt lawyers and the corrupt judges and the corrupt politicians and the corrupt everything are taking advantage of the honest people. And he's saying, God, how come you're not taking care of them? And God honestly is. He's giving them Habakkuk to preach at them. He's given them the truth. That's the mercy of God, is that he's still letting people preach at them even though they're doing wrong. And because they're not going to get right, then the second half of this chapter happens. Verse 5, Behold ye among the heathen in regard, and wonder marvelously. For I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe, though it be told you. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. And as a side note, that land belongs to Israel whether they're there or not. Chaldea can possess it, but it's never Chaldean land. And just because somebody else owned it or may have owned it at some point in time doesn't mean that it's not Jewish land and always has been and always will be. Verse 7, they are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed for of themselves. I'm not going to get super deep into that because I went into it on Sunday. Uh, but they're judging based on how they feel and what they want to do. They are their own judges. They are their own final authority. They have complete control over Israel. They can do whatever they want and get away with it. If you still think human nature is good and human nature is decent, we're all just little good little people down on the inside, uh, that's not what happens when somebody conquers somebody else. That's not what happens. It's not, well, well now that you're my slaves, I'm going to take good care of you. It's, no, you're my slaves. I'm getting everything I want out of you. I got free labor. I just have to keep you alive and keep you in, in chains and keep you fed and clothed, but, man, I'm getting all this for free now. That's what, that's what man does to man. It's man, man, human nature is broken, it is wicked, it is devious. And if you take all the checks off of a person, that's what they do. Their judgment proceedeth from themselves. They're not going around talking about, well, you know, we got to be nice to everybody. No, I'm not being nice to you. I don't have to be. I can get away with it. I'm going to do whatever I want. That's what the Chaldeans are going to do to the Jews here. Verse 8, their horses also are swifter than leopards, and are more fierce than the evening wolves, and their horsemen shall spread themselves, and their horsemen shall come from far. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. Now you've got to compare it to a couple things here. Your horses are swifter than leopards. Now that leopard's a great connotation in your Bible. Uh, the leopard in your Bible is a type of the Antichrist. Uh, that's Revelation chapter 13, I believe, and... Uh, the, what's the other reference about the Ethiopian changing his, uh, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? And when it talks about that leopard, uh, that leopard is a cat. He's a reference to, uh, let me check this reference here. It's, I always get off on this. It's not. Uh, yeah, Reve, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 13. Uh, in verse 1, it says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having ten seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and in great authority. So that's the Antichrist here. And you got to remember, when you read through um, the book of Revelation, just as God is a trinity, the devil is a trinity as well. And... Uh, God the Father, oh, almost, let's go, oh, this is, no, that's the old green marker, this is a good one, God the Father, is a, the Bible says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, so you've got God the Father, He's a spirit. And in the book of Revelation, Satan is the spirit. He's the dragon. I just wrote spirit twice. Satan, the dragon. Because in that passage, Revelation 13, the dragon gives power to the beast. Now, the beast 
is the man on earth. It's the Antichrist himself. And you really got to parse this out because it does get a little convoluted. That's why I'm writing it out. Uh, you've got the Trinity is in three parts. God the Father is a spirit. Then you've got Jesus Christ the Son. And he's flesh. And then you've got the Antichrist. The leopard beast. Physical, phys you got spiritual, physical, and then the third part is the Holy Spirit. And we'll do that in red. But you've got the Holy Spirit. which is spirit, and that's the false prophet that goes out and he prophesies throughout all the earth. And you've got a, you've got a three-part God, you've got a three-part devil. And it isn't, these aren't three parts of a single being the way that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are single. There are three distinct uh, individuals but when you read through and it talks about that, the leopard, the leopard is not talking about Satan. The leopard is talking about the Antichrist, who is probably resurrected Judas Iscariot, but that's a different study for a different time. Uh, so in here, he talks about their horses being swifter than leopards. Uh, it's a reference to the, the, to the Antichrist himself. That's his, that's his beast. Uh, and it says, and are more fierce than the evening wolves. Now, in Zephaniah chapter 3, there's a reference to what that's like. Zephaniah chapter 3, uh, it says, Woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. The oppressing city. She obeyed not the voice. She received not correction. She trusted not in the Lord. She drew not near to her God. Her princes within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. They gnaw not the bones to the morrow. So an evening wolf is something that devours, and it devours quickly. It's not devouring the bones till tomorrow. It's getting them all taken care of tonight. It's aggressive, it's fast, and it's taken over. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 5, really quickly, keep your hand in Habakkuk. Jeremiah chapter 5. In Jeremiah chapter 5, look down in verse 4. It says, Therefore I said, Surely these are poor, they are foolish, for they know not the way of the Lord, nor the judgment of their God. I will get me unto the great men, I will speak unto them, for they have known the way of the Lord, and the judgment of their God. But these have altogether broken the yoke, and burst the bonds. Wherefore the lion of the forest shall slay them, and a wolf of the evening shall spoil them. A leopard shall watch over their cities. Everyone that goeth out thence shall be torn in pieces, because their transgressions are many, and their backslidings are increased. He talks about the wolf of the evening. That's a wolf that creates fear. Uh, you can't see a wolf in the evening. You can only hear it, and you know it's out there, and you know it's coming for you. And that's a, uh, that's a lot like your adversary, the devil, walking about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. When he roars, you can hear him, but if it's nighttime, you're not going to see him. Now, in your Bible, you got to remember, this is 600 B.C. Israel first gets into the Promised Land, 1400 B.C., and when they come in, God says, I'm not going to give you all of the land right off the bat, lest the beasts overtake it. This is a thousand years before Jesus Christ was born. Wild beasts are a much bigger problem than they are today, especially in Southern Maryland. We don't have anything that eats people in Southern Maryland. Long time ago, we might have had bobcats or wildcats. I've heard people say, oh, there used to be bears down this far or things like that. There might have been, but today we don't worry about any. There's nothing that's going to eat you if you go out in the woods tonight. They had a major problem back then with the beasts of the field overtaking them. Uh, you had to worry about leopards. You had to worry about lions. You had to worry about bears. You had to worry about wolves. Why? They'd eat you. And he's using, he's pulling in real life examples to say, hey, you guys better be ready. They're coming, they're coming fast, and they're going to get you. And he's pulling in these, these different comparisons to teach them what's coming for them. It's coming fast like a horse, and it's coming scary like a wolf. You better be ready. 
and it's, it's, it's coming aggressive like a leopard. And, and it says in the end, they shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. Whenever you see the eagle, that's also a reference to your second advent because it talks about in Revelation 19, when Jesus Christ comes back, he talks about preparing a sacrifice for the fowls of the air. He says, when I come back and I kill all these people, uh, the birds are going to feast. Uh, that's, that's, that's Revelation. That's a different passage here. 19, that's... Uh, yeah, in Revelation 19, verse 17, And I saw an angel standing in the sun. This is right immediately after... Uh, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and they shall rule them with a, or he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth out the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw the, an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of the heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feed you all really well, and that's the Battle of Armageddon, and that's in the future. That's coming up. But the, refer- the cross-reference is there. God says, look, when a lot of people are going to die, I call in the eagles. So that's what he's talking about here in verse 8. Now, verse 9. And they shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind, and they shall gather the captives as the sand. Now, that sup up as the east wind, that's to consume. Uh, that's when your Bible, when he talks about, uh, um, I stand at the door and knock, and whosoever will answer unto me, I will come in unto him and, we sh- and sup with him. That's eating. He says, I'm going to consume them the way that the east wind consumes. Well, <laughs> run the east wind in your Bible. East wind's not good. East wind is always destroying, consuming, it's driving away things. Uh, Genesis chapter 41, yeah, I believe is the chapter, it talks about Joseph and his dream, or I'm sorry, Pharaoh and his dream that Joseph interprets. And you've got the seven ears that grow up and they're blasted with the east wind. And that's why they're in such bad shape. It's because they're blasted, what, with the east wind. And when that east wind comes, it's not a good wind. And he says, they're going to come up, and it says, and they shall come all, for violence, their faces shall sup up as the east wind. They're going to consume you. They're going to consume you the way that the wind blows through the land. And he's pulling in all these different references. He's preaching it to them where they're at. And you've got to preach to people and teach to people where they're at. There are books and commentaries on Habakkuk, and I am struggling to read through them. And I barely understand half the words in them. And they're written, why? They're written as smart people to write to smart people so they can sound smart to their smart people friends. And let's let's put it like this. If I write something that's so complicated that you can't understand me, you go, wow, he must be smart. And then I can just tell you whatever. You go, well, Ben must be right because he's super smart. Well, if I write a stupid book that's got all this garbage in it, it's just buzzwords and grammar and references to the Akkadian language and all these different things, well, there's just, all that is is a power grab. It's a, it's a show of head knowledge. It's not useful at all. And most of the people that do that, they aren't, even, they aren't King James people. They're trying to figure out this passage, and they end up with just nothing. They're trying to say, well, it could be this, but it also, it could be a reference to this. And this word here means this, but it also can be translated as this, and it's got roots in this word, which alludes to this. Well, what can you tell me? Nothing. I could just give you assumptions and vague things, and if I'm the expert and I can only be vague at best, the rest of the people don't have a shot. I mean, that's the guy that I was listening to. I was listening to his podcast, and people are sending him questions, and one of the questions is, you know, is Luke 16 literal or not? He goes, well... About the rich man in hell, about the this, and then how come this is referenced, but Lazarus isn't a Hebrew name, and the this, and I don't believe, and he gets to the end, and he goes, the case for it is not very strong, but the case against it is even less strong. So really, you don't, you can't tell me a thing is what you're saying. You can't teach anything is what you're saying. Who's that? This It's a brilliant guy. It's a very smart guy. It's a very well-educated guy. He can't tell you anything about the Bible. 
What can I tell you about the passage? The Bible says there was a rich man. It doesn't say there was a, Jesus spoke in a parable and said, it says there was a rich man. Okay, he was real, he existed, and when he died, he went to hell and he's still there. That's more than you can get in 15 minutes of jargon from the mess that people put. But that's why Christianity is such a mess. Because nobody says, thus say those scriptures. Well, what does the Bible say? I don't know. What does the Bible say about itself? Just take the references and run them. Take the cross references and say, well, how does the Bible interpret this? I don't get it. Okay, study it and pray about it. The Bible says the scriptures have no private interpretation. You have the interpreter in you. If you have a question, ask the author. If you don't understand it, ask the author. He wrote it. He can tell you. And God likes to use people that aren't well-educated because then he can put to silence the educated people. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And God uses those for people. That's why he says, I can't use many mighty or many noble people. Why? Because they're full of themselves. They're good for nothing. I can't get any glory out of it. Anyways, um, Habakkuk chapter ten, uh, 1 verse 10 they shall scoff at the kings and the princes shall be a scorn to them. They shall deride every stronghold, for they shall heap dust and take it. There is nothing that's going to stop them. It's like trying to stop the wind. You can't stop the wind. And when the Antichrist comes in, you are not going to stop him. What does the Bible say? It says, let them that are in the city flee into the mountains. Let not him that is in the field return to take his coat again. It says, you better just go. It says, the wind is coming for you. You've got to outrun the wind if you're going to make it. And the Jews that run, make it. Uh, in Jeremiah, he tells the Jews, they get besieged by the Assyrians, and they say, what do we do? He goes, surrender. Jeremiah, the great patriot, what do we do? Surrender to the invaders. Surrender to the Chinese. Surrender to the Russians. You ever show, I mean, that's, we don't have prophets like that, but imagine that. You know, the European Union shows up on your front door, and they're killing people, and they take on the East Coast, and it's like, well, what do we do? And Pastor gets up, and he goes, it's time for a we to... <laughs> We're Americans. So you're going to fire my guns from my cold, dead hands. Okay, well, they'll fire their guns from the cold, dead hands. That's what happens. But that's what Jeremiah says. God told me to tell everybody to surrender. And the people that surrender are spared. And in the tribulation, the people who run are spared. The people who try to make a deal with the Antichrist, try to work with the Antichrist, try and fight the wind... Don't make it. Uh, verse 11, and verse 11 is where I'm going to stop because verse 11 is where it really kicks into high gear doctrinally. Verse 11 says, Then shall his mind change. Well, who's the his? I mean, if you read through the passage, it's they, 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 they. Who's he? Well, it says, Then, sh then shall his mind change, and he shall pass over and offend, imputing his power unto his God. The Antichrist gets to come in here because God says, hey, I need you to whoop up on the Jews. But that's only, you're only doing it because I let you. And he's going to come in and he's going to take over Judah and he goes, I did this by myself. I'm the conqueror. I'm the great. I'm Alexander the Great. I'm Darius the Great. I'm Herod the Great. I'm Muhammad Ali the Great. And God's going to go, uh-uh-uh. You didn't do this because you're so, so strong. You did this because I let you. And that's my people. You better be gentle. And what happens? They're not gentle. And what happens? God overthrows them because of what they did to his people. But God told them to. Yeah, he told them to. God let them. Yeah, he let them. And then God punished them for doing it. Why? Because I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. That's your God careful with how you deal with God, because that's what he does. Now, what, what's the purpose of the tribulation? The purpose of the tribulation is to straighten out the Jews. What's the purpose of the Chaldean invasion? To straighten out the Jews. It's to fix their idolatry problem. What's the purpose of the tribulation? To fix the Jews' self-righteousness problem. The Jews have had a couple different problems through time. They struggle with idolatry, but when, 630, uh, when 606 happens and 6... Uh, 600 and 586 happen. After that, there's no more Jewish idolatry problem. What do they have after that? After that, they have a self-righteous problem. They get the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the heady and high-minded people. And what does the tribulation do? The tribulation cleans that out. Why? Because God says, except those days should be shortened, no flesh should be saved. 
and God has to miraculously protect those Jews during their tribulation so that they have to accept the fact that they crucified their Messiah, and it's not their own greatness, it's not their own self-righteousness that gives them the blessing of God. It's God's mercy, and it's God's Son, and when they accept him, he steps in and saves them. But that's the whole purpose of the tribulation. The whole purpose of the tribulation is to pull that Jewish nation back to God, which is another great reason you know you're not going through it. Why? It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Why does Jacob get in trouble in Genesis? Because he's trying to do it himself. And he doesn't have God's blessing on him. He's just going about trying to get things his own way, and he's scheming and conniving his way onto the top, which is what the Jews do today. That's why the Jews run Disney, and they run the Supreme Court, and they run the this, and they run the that, and they run the news media, and they run Hollywood. They, they do. They run it all. Why? Because they're schemers and they're connivers. And God's going to go, hey, I want your heart and he's going to get it. But that's the purpose of the tribulation, is to get them off their high horse, to knock them down all the pegs, take them to the very bottom, and say, all right, now look up to me. And the ones that do will make it. Uh, but that's Habakkuk. Uh, when he gets here talking about imputing his power to his God, that's this Antichrist here getting his power from his beast, or this beast getting power from Satan, the dragon. And we'll run the references on that uh, Sunday morning. And then we'll get into 12 through 17, and 12 through 17 is its whole other bag of chips. But it is. That's a weird one. There's, I'm going to teach. There's two different ways to teach that, and I'm going to try and teach them both. But and they're, I think they're both smart. I'm not going to go against one guy that I've heard teach it, but I have a different take on it personally. But Habakkuk, it's thick, it's fast, but it's good for you because it'll teach you this is how God works. This is What does he see? He solves the bigger picture. He sees long term. That's what we've been talking about, the fruit of the Spirit. What does God do? He fixes the bigger picture. He fixes the long term issue. He's not looking at here now. He's looking at the hereafter. But uh, let's pray and we'll pick it up, Lord willing, Sunday morning. Lord, we thank you, God, for being long-suffering with us. Thank you for being merciful to us, God. Thank you for punishing us less than our iniquities deserve. I pray you help us to understand you more, understand you better, God, to, to look to you when things start to go wrong and to, to, to take our questions to you, Lord, and to let you uh, reprove us. And I pray you help us to try and understand your mind better and to be more like you And as we go about our lives down here. We might be able to give an answer to all that ask, Lord, and we can show Jesus Christ Lord, in his, in his mercy and in his judgment, God, to a lost and dying world. We love you, Father. We thank you for being good to us. Pray you get us back home safe and bring us back again on Sunday. Pray you take us home soon. In Jesus' name, amen.